Episode number one, Pithy right. Musings. Here pithy we are. Musings. Right? Super, super exciting day. So we put the funk back <laughs> into being human. We do. That's what Pithy Musings is all about. Pithy Musings is for learners and experiencers and thinkers and feelers, adventurers. Well, we are feelers. We are both, for those that are listening and watching, we're both ENFJs for those Myers-Briggs folks out there. Um, so we share, we share that. Okay, so today's the first episode. And really where this came from was having many, many conversations where we would finish and say, that should have been recorded or someone else should hear what we are talking about because it is big. The musings are, I think, fascinating. Um, so that's why we're here. Yeah. And so I would love to share how the story of how we met. And first, yes, I would love for you to share with everybody, because I think you're amazing, who you are and- Ditto. Okay, you go first. <laughs> I, guess we, I guess we better do some introductions. Okay, so for those that are listening and don't know who I am, um, my name is Carolyn Berglund and I am based in the beautiful city of Calgary. Um, I also am the principal of a new organization by the name of Talk Talk and also a sister organization called the One Stop Special Needs Shop. And Eva, who are you? <laughs> I'm a leadership and team coach with Fervor Leadership Coaching and Consulting and the founder and uh, also growing the business. It's a super exciting time. Feel very honored to do this work. And because I'm so excited about this purpose work, that's how you and I met which is a little bit of a story in itself. And seeing as this episode is about stories, that everyone has yep. a story, why don't we start with mm -hmm. how we met and how we came to be here? Well, it was funny because we were just talking about this, right? Like, how did we meet? And it was, for those that think that LinkedIn, you know, doesn't work, this is a platform. Apparently, I liked one of uh, your posts. I, and then you kind of were checking out who was liking your post because who doesn't do that? And uh, then you sent me a message and we were kind of going back and forth. And what I failed to mention in my introduction where we, where we have um, some, some shared philosophies around leadership. So I also play in the space of leadership as, as, as do you. Um, and then we set up a call. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking that first call, I was in my car Mm -hmm. uh, having dropped off my son. Um, and we just, we had, we knew a bunch of people, um, mutual people. Yeah. And we just it, literally, it clicked in milliseconds, I think, in terms of just connecting to core values, integrity, all of that stuff. Yeah. For How sure. do you remember it? Yeah, same. I, it was this, it was this fascinating. It's like I, the moment you and I connected and had the opportunity to start our musings, it was like I'd known you all my life, or I had known you from a past life, not to get too yeah. woo, but it's like, I just known you for a long time. And so yeah. it's about a year and a half later, we come up with the idea of pithy musings. I think maybe it was a month ago. Yeah. And we're saying, well, why, why do something like this alone? We each want to do something. We, we both share so many values and interest spaces and desire to contribute in the world. We thought, why well, do this alone? I always said in this business that I would never do this alone. 
that collaboration yeah. was going to be really important for me to be my best self. That's the creative space that's connected to sense of belonging and contribution. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think we had this call. Yeah. And in yeah, fact, like a month ago. Marketing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there we have a video of us dancing by ourselves solo I know, in the introduction. Right? <laughs> Nothing awkward no, and I, that. No, nothing, nothing at all. Um, and I think to your point around collaboration, uh, I am a collaborator, as are you. And when you you have your own independent practice, it can feel fairly lonely at times. And um, so to have you to collaborate on something like this and just other musings, quite frankly, has been um, nothing short of a, a great gift. Um, I think that also I want to say is that I think oftentimes people in businesses try to be, oh, I've screwed that up, but you know what I mean, right? And the, the, I think the other point is around women. That's where I was trying to go with that, wow. is that women often, there's this mean girls business shit that goes on, right? Where, um, you know, women in business, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure you've had experiences around, you know, jealousy or whatever and i like the message of two independent strong women coming together and collaborating in an open forum in an open space mm -hmm. no i love that too this is uh this is an act of a leap of faith this is an experiment mm -hmm. um it's exciting to be here with you uh, and it's a leap of trust too it's a it's a total practice of going on gut so mm -hmm. it's really exciting to have Whoever is listening in, whoever is watching, it's super exciting to be able to share this <laughs> moment with people. This is one of many more episodes that we are looking forward to sharing in the world. We can't stop coming up with ideas. I mean, we literally yep. can't stop. And throughout the day, there's yep. more. Ideas. I can't keep tabs of all of them. So there's a lot of energy around this. And uh, at the end of the conversation, we'll share a way to reach each of us if others have ideas too. And so, shall we dive into, or you've got something to well, say. Well, before we do that, yeah, before we do that, I think we've got we to bring out the elephant in the room, which is what's with all these disco balls? Do you want to explain why we're <laughs> so into the disco? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, there's, a, you know, it's really hard actually to find disco balls that will come to your home in the time that you need. Apparently there's a shortage of disco balls. But <laughs> the disco balls and the whole music scene is because we also have a love of um, two related genres of music, disco and funk. <laughs> so like on a, I can't stop listening to disco and funk. It's my thing. So um, yeah, was there something else you want to add about the elephant in the room, i.e. the <laughs> No, I think I, I think it's just it's cool when not only do you connect on so many other value system, but then we started talking about disco and it was like, yeah, like the hustle. So what we're going to tell you about a little bit later is that we're going to be attaching um, a playlist to Pithy Muses, but we'll give you all of that later. But yes, to your point, Eva, sorry for derailing us. Let's get into the topic, which no. is everyone. Everyone has a story. Yeah. And on what do you on think? derailing, and here's another thing too, random derailing, interrupting, I forgive me, I'm not remembering who said this, but embrace the awkward. We're in a virtual, a more virtual world than we've ever <laughs> right. been. And so we are yeah. celebrating and embracing the awkward and we have invested in some gear so we don't cut each other off too much. So here we are. <laughs> so. Well, perfect doesn't exist. And if you've met it, I'd like, I'd like to be introduced to it, right? No, there's, there's, I, I have learned through a few amazing influences in this life that there is a gift in embracing imperfection. That's right. Yeah. So speaking about imp imperfection, it, yeah. that goes nicely into our topic of everyone has a story, right? Yeah. So I think, you know, when we we kind of crafted episode one and we landed on this as being the first topic, you know, I did a quick Google search. Yeah. And it I think it's a hot topic for, for those that are interested. And I think I'm going to read a, a quote that I think everybody's heard before, but I think it, it, it summarizes quite nicely why we want to explore this. And it is 
Remember that everyone you meet is afraid of something, loves something and has lost something. Another one that I absolutely love, I love quotes by the way, um, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Hmm. So why, why Eva is this so important to explore? Not only from, and I think this podcast is really about not just professional musings. I think it's, it's intertwined with personal um, stories as well. But so why did you think it was so important for us to, to talk about this today? Mm, where to begin? Um, I, I think we have a shared passion around everyone has a story in both understanding one's own story and the importance of that, as well as understanding the stories of others. I think there's some complexity to it. Um, understanding someone's, someone else's story, for example, in the day-to-day -day can be really important to, you know, for, for well-being, for example, and in how we treat one another. Uh, you know, the grumpy driver on the road who completely cut you off and flipped you the bird. And you know, I don't remember what it's like to drive anymore, know, right? FYI, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know I get so excited if I can actually go drive to the store. Uh, <laughs> get to go grocery shopping, yes! <laughs> I know, and secretly I've been going through some extra aisles just for the experience of being in extra aisles and being outside the house. Um, but I think, I think there's a few, a few areas. I think, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, there's someone wise years ago, and forgive me, I'm not remembering who, who, who said the quote, but um, you know, everyone's having a hard day in one way or another. Everyone has mm -hmm. a context. So I can choose to get emotionally gripped and hooked by that bad driver uh, and their rage and let that take me down and sit in judgment of that other person. And maybe that person is en route to a hospital. Right. Or maybe that person sure. is, you know, rushing home because of some traumatic event or whatever. Sure. Right. Some maybe somebody's having a baby. Yeah. Right. So I, I think, you know, in those moments, everyone has a story it can even be a mantra so that I don't get emotionally gripped. And so that I'm offering some empathy and just just faith and trust and forgiveness in that person and, and hopefully things, things are okay for them. Yep. Um, I think we also see it in, in, in organizations. We see it in, in leadership. Everyone yep. has a story. Sometimes it's a tough work environment. Sometimes yep. we're having a tough day on the job and we come into yep. something with a heavy energy. Mm -hmm. What's behind that heavy energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and also how much, Sometimes there's cultural ramifications as well. Sometimes there is even a trauma history that's coming into how someone shows up in life and in work. So I think mm -hmm. it's under, it's letting go of judgment and acknowledging mm -hmm. that we're all part of one humanity, if we so choose mm -hmm. to look at it that way, that we each have mm -hmm. a context. Yes. I think a real tangible example of what you're talking about around leadership is through this pandemic. Mm. So at the start of the pen, the first wave, what was that 10 years ago now? I think it's only been <laughs> 10 months. I don't even know, but know, whatever. I mean, I'm celebrating my 84th birthday coming up. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but we, I, I did a series of round tables and talked to various leaders across this country and said, you know, what are the leader behaviors that have shifted or pivoted since this, this COVID thing uh, came to be? And what was absolutely um, consistent in every person in which I spoke was that the leader behaviors, competency skills, whatever, that were required pre-COVID look completely different than uh, during COVID, and, and we'll talk about post-COVID perhaps a little bit later, but those were competencies around empathy, vulnerability, kindness, where leaders, we all went to this virtual world and leaders would have to check in and say, how are you doing? Like, are you okay? And 
when we talk about everybody has a story, you actually have to unearth, well, if, it, if you were a leader that didn't ask a lot of questions, you'd have to start asking the questions or having conversations around, oh my, man, you've got kids at home. Mm -hmm. So what are the implications around work for that? Oh my goodness, you have you know, parents that are wherever and are they okay or in a you know, retirement community and really having these human moments of how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a perfect illustration, I think, of everyone has a story, mm -hmm. having been brought to the fore as being incredibly important. Mm -hmm. My concern, because mm -hmm. I continue to have uh, discussions with leaders across the country, North America, wherever, is that there's a fatigue around this pandemic, a real fatigue where I'm just done with it. Mm -hmm and people reverting back to old ways of being. And so the concern around that is, you showed me some love yeah. before. You kind of got to know me and my kid who is running into the room or my cat or my dog or whatever. And now you are reverting back to those uh, old muscles or flexing those old muscles, right? Of just goals, 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 objectives, objectives, objectives. Um, so leaders are no longer afforded the luxury of not seeing the humanness of, of leadership. And that part of that is really understanding that muscle of being curious and asking questions. Mm -hmm. One of the things we talked about, Eva, um, I think last time was, but there's a balance around that, right? So if you're just noodling and asking a bunch of questions, that can come across as quite... Oh. invasive like I don't want to tell you my story so what do you think about that I think there's well I think there's room for boundaries in both you know one's own emotional intelligence to tune in on boundaries and one's own strength of voice to assert what one is okay with and not okay with so as much as we can talk about empathy and curiosity, curiosity in particular, there's also re reading, reading the room, whether it's one-on-one -on -one, in mm -hmm. group, read the energy mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and being okay with those boundaries being, being set. You know, there are part of, part of what I also wanted to touch on is one of the reasons why we feel this topic is so important is because of there's an opportunity for connection and sense of belonging or divisiveness and silos. We see that in our day to day, in our personal lives and our work lives. Understanding one's story can be in the moment and can be connected to history, legacy, childhood, all of those things. It's context and it can create when we, when we find healthy ways to create understanding and let judgment go. I think mm -hmm. there is so much opportunity to create healthier connection and sense of belonging versus someone feeling alienated, misunderstood, because we're seeing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. I also think to your earlier, boy, I've got a lot of thoughts here. Um, I also think to your <laughs> This is what we do. We muse and it gets pithy. This is what we do. This is what we do. Yeah. <laughs> Naturally. Um, uh, where, where was I headed with that? Um, uh, well, anyway, it'll come back. You know, those thoughts, they go, they go floating away and then they come back. They always come back when they really. Yeah. No, I, yeah. 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 I think, I think, I think what we're, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and, that relationships, I think, if I were to punctuate kind of what you're saying there, is relationships, personal and professional, grow when you take off that freaking mask. You know, I often talk about the mask. Yes. So, you know, I'm going to only show you this part, part of me, or I'm going to pretend this is who I am. It's also that iceberg example, right? That, that, us facilitators like to use, right? Okay. Where you have the iceberg at the top. And then the waterline, and then it's really everybody's story underneath that waterline. I think bringing down that waterline, showing people a little bit more and more of who you are, being vulnerable, being trusting enough to do that, 
creates a human connectedness that is so critical, not only personally, but professionally. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's those relationships that I have with my clients, and I'd love to hear about your relationships with your clients, the ones that are really trusting and I understand their stories are the strongest. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of my clients, I think we were talking about this before, is are their friends now. And I had someone that I worked with uh, in the past that said, I don't know if you want to really go there. And I went, why? Mm-hmm. We're human beings living a human experience. And whether you're a client or a supplier or whatever, you're going to connect with people. And you do that mm-hmm. through you know, exploring story and relationship and trust. Well, and, so, and, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just, I think it matters. I think that's why we're talking about it today. It matters. So if you want, if you're someone that's listening to this and, you know, you're in a business like ours, let's say, let's say you're another independent consultant, I would, I would, I, we'll get to some tips a little bit later, but I would, ex- I would, I would conjecture that exploring your own story becomes important, but also being curious about other people will help Mm -hmm. um, attract, retain clients. Mm -hmm. And I think inside of organizational cultures, attract, retain, and, and, and create, you know, incredible loyalists and culture builders and movement makers within organizations when we can create space for, I think part of what we're talking about is also rooted in psychological safety. Yeah, Amy Edmondson, love her. Right? Yep. And I think that we have, many of us have been groomed to believe, to your point about the mask, we have been groomed to believe that we have to wear the mask, we have to hyper achieve, that Mm -hmm. it is about results and operational excellence. And I think right now, the the whole pandemic thing, and, you know, people were very caring at a certain point, tried to be more caring, and now people are sort of, okay, when's this going to go away? Let business as usual. Have we lost our manners? Have we lost our way? Are we in survival mode? Whether we are in survival mode, or we are stuck in, you know, some of the elements of capitalism that are tough. We can't lose sight of the people focus because if we leave our people behind, that business will not survive. So are we talking about creating a stage where every staff member has to get up on stage and tell their life story? No, we are not talking about that. It's ultimately in sitting with less judgment, more empathy, more curiosity, for another, however that shows up that the other is okay with and that you're okay with. And I think part of being able to connect with another person is also in understanding the experiences and learnings and gifts and trials and triumphs of your own story. Yeah. Something that, you know, it, or you go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, as I was, Thinking about this episode, um, I remembered that uh, a colleague of mine, friend, took me through an exercise of what she called a lifeline. Yeah. So quite literally, we stood uh, at on the wall and created events in my own personal life, both the great stuff that happened and the not so great stuff. And that exercise of exploration up until today and then and then looking at well what are those stories that you want to create for for yourself in the future now there's stuff that happens so you can't predict everything but that entire exercise that real reflection was so helpful to me because I realized how I have changed as a human being based on those experiences Mm -hmm. right why did I develop this leadership philosophy of kindness? Well, that comes from not being treated very kind or people not treating my son very kind or whatever. So I just don't allow that energy anymore. So that reflection becomes absolutely critical. So you talk about 
we're going to get everybody else's story, but it's also about understanding what is your story here. Mm -hmm. And getting grounded in that, in that, in, in, and understanding the power of that. Um, and in one of our tips later on, we, you know, we share an idea to, around, around doing that, that lifeline exercise. I love that you're bringing that up. It reminds me of a time when I was on an executive team that was full of good people and very disconnected. And we had gone on a, mm. on a retreat with a, a, a fabulous couple of team coaches. Um, and I will never forget that exercise. I've, I've saved it. It's in, it's in my files because it was so powerful. So same, you know, you, you sort of all those learnings of the experiences, the gifts, the trials, triumphs. What was so neat was the connective tissue that came of doing the exercise as individuals and sharing what we felt comfortable sharing that felt safe to share and the things that came out of people's stories were i mean many of us were in tears uh which was also yeah. so great it's so uncomfortable to cry at work that's a whole episode in itself but the connective yeah. tissue that came of sharing i all of a sudden thought oh i just thought you had it lucky all these years and you rose quickly and I thought you were a little arrogant. Woo, judge. Right. I right? learned that this person I had epic struggle. This person and others were survivors of real hardship. Right. Well, and look at the mask that they were presenting to the universe. So that you, you right? So we've all got this armor. But oh. my guess, Eva, is that team that you're talking about this retreat, hmm. how they showed up on day one looked pretty different than the uh, the last day. What oh. was the difference? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> right? There was. You're hugging. You're, oh. Right? Oh. Doing all of that. Full on. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That was, that was epic. So you know, again, power of story and um, honoring one another. And, you know, and another thing that I, I wanted to touch on was honoring cultural story. An example of that, mm -hmm. um, an example of that, for example, uh, let's see, um, co-facilitating some work, uh, some work that I, I really love and believe in, very, very big schedule over a couple of days, really need people to go th to, to get through the content. Um, mm -hmm. Some folks, you know, some some members of, of our indigenous communities um, had joined us, which we, we were so blessed to have them and their presence and their sharing there because they shared story. And some of the content was very mm. triggering for them, for a, a couple mm. of them. And they asked to leave the room and, uh, mm. you know, ha they were so gracious and they said, we need, we don't know how long we need. We just need to do this. And this is part of our healing and supporting of one another. And there was sharing in story with one another that needed to go on for however long it needed to go on. And meanwhile, thinking, okay, there's this curriculum, got to get them through this curriculum big learning yeah big learning yeah in that context so yeah. story in that context story knows no clock can i ask though what was the triggering content that um mm. Mm. i'll i'll simply offer that it 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 it, it i can see how you know we get into topics of shame yeah I can see yep. how yep. that can be triggering. So, th so that's another thing. As we start having more vulnerability in the workplace and we start story sharing, that gets into honoring boundaries of self and another, honoring cultural mm -hmm. um, differences and the ramifications of those. And it really comes down to seeking understanding yep. and creating space for one another versus seeing differences through a judgment lens, through an agenda, and, and create yeah. space for and with 
one another, I think is what, what we're talking about. Yeah, and I think just for the facilitators that might be listening to us, um, I mean, we've been at this gig for a gajillion years and it will. I will say that when I have hit my groove facilitating is when I get off those PowerPoint slides. Mm. I've, I've, I've prepared ad nauseum and then I allow the group mm. to teach each other. Yeah, beautiful. Where it is the most the most powerful thing mm -hmm. and then you actually as facilitator get vulnerable as well mm -hmm. i don't know if i ever told you that i had um one cohort um that was all female mm -hmm. and that graduated i think it was last year or the year before what fun that was because at this point I've, I've learned to get off the PowerPoint slide and allow things to just naturally emerge. Like I know where it needs to go, right? I know the topics that need to be covered, but it doesn't have to be so linear. Mm -hmm. So just having that spirit of everyone has a story while even facilitating mm -hmm. has been unbelievable. Like the way I used to facilitate and how I do now, Oh, completely different with the foundation of allow these stories to emerge when it feels right and when it's natural and when um, the group is in a, you know, a trusting environment. That psychological safety that you mentioned earlier also goes into workshop or teams or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so with all that said, what, you know, I was talking about my timeline and, and some of the things that have impacted um, how I am today. What is what is a story for you that has changed you as the per, as a person the most? Well, and I, I, I I'm I'm going to answer that. And yep. your your sharing of the you know how things have evolved in facilitating and sharing made me also think of well, what's a vehicle for let's just say a leader at any level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm to navigate all this that we're talking about. And one of the things that comes to mind is the philosophy of leader as coach. Yeah. We don't, you know, you, you don't have to go bonkers like I did where I decided to have a second career, which is one of the best things I've ever done. However, right. right? And it started with leader as coach and had the privilege of learning in an organization that was very progressive for its time who invested in leaders becoming not a fully accredited coaches, but learning basic skills. And those skills teach you about empathy and curiosity and deep listening and creating psychological safety. And there are so many resources out there, you know, a couple of books that come to mind, um, both written by Michael Bengay Stenier, um, The Coaching Habit, The Advice Trap, highly recommended uh, for leaders at any level. So I, I wanted to weave that in there. And now to answer your question. <laughs> um, yeah, so something that sort of grounded me in my, you know, a piece of my story that grounded mm -hmm. me in, in purpose and values. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, there are countless, uh, there are countless stories that are completely ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I've cracked myself up when I've done some of my own storyline stuff. Uh, I've also been deeply moved in doing some of my own storyline stuff. Everybody has a story. Everybody has struggle that others don't know. So a piece of the story that, that I'll touch on goes back to uh, being in my early 20s and I'm starting out my career. And, you know, there's, there's a couple of parts to it. I had finished my schooling and I'm knocking on the doors. I'm thinking of either becoming the next Barbara Walters or bless, <laughs> bless Barbara. Um, and I could see it. Oh, well, thanks. Um, hey, Bar <laughs> Barbara's amazing. So I was either going to be the next Barbara Walters or pursue marketing, uh, maybe both. And so I was trying to get my first break and I was applying. So I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm waitressing at a fabulous pub here in Victoria, um, Spinnaker's for anybody that hasn't tried it. So good, uh, <laughs> beautiful views, but getting off topic there, I was going to muse on that one. I'm trying to get my first break. <laughs> 
I'm applying everywhere. I'm not getting any calls back. And that's when we got calls back because, you know, email wasn't as popular. I'm officially aging myself. Right. And it was so hard. Did you have a landline? <laughs> I, I had I had a landline. Um, hello? You remember yeah. that, that cord? And you're stuck and you can't like go anywhere? God. Um, Our younger generation is going to be, what are you talking about? Yeah. I know. Right? Di Do you remember dialing? Um, so I'm trying to get my first book forever. And if you got one digit wrong, you had to hang up and do it all over. And start all over, <laughs> start all over. I know. Um, so trying to get my first break, a couple of pieces. One, I thought the world of CBC and I was like, I will work for you for free. So I knocked on the door mm. of this woman. Her name was Elizabeth Dickmont. Wherever you are, Elizabeth, you are my hero for taking me in. I called her repeatedly. Yeah. I would, I finally right. would actually go to Vancouver. So I do my waitressing shifts. I'd go to Vancouver. I'd stay with my brother in New Westminster. I would take the bus down to CBC. And I literally sat in the lobby and asked for when Elizabeth Dickmont had five minutes. I think I did that. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, it's on the edge of sounding weird. It wasn't that weird. I was, I was persistent and passionate and I, I did that about <laughs> three times. She finally came down and saw me and she looked at me and she said, I can't say no to you. So <laughs> fast, fast forward, she gives me a bit of a break, but I get asked to leave after like two months. So there I was ferrying back and forth. I get asked to leave after two months because the union viewed it as it's not that I wasn't doing well. It's that it was a conflict for the union. So the other piece of the story. So then I'm like, oh, rejection. And I'm back to waitressing again. And I've sent out so many CVs and everyone wants experience. And I just didn't have any. So mm -hmm. I decide to move to London, England. Much to my family's chagrin, my first four months in England, I look back and I go, oh my gosh, I have no, I, I have no idea how I survived it. In my first, I, I arrive, my luggage is stolen. I have no insurance. I have very little money in my back pocket, which was to carry me for like a month thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to get a job when I hit the streets because I didn't have a job. I was going to go get one and I was going to go build something. And so I end up waitressing, barely making enough money to just simply get by. People don't tip there. I was given, I don't know, I, maybe I'd make a certain, uh, like very little money in tips that would cover my cab home at two in the morning. So I was on, I was living on the edge. I finally get a break and this boutique marketing agency takes me on. And I literally think I've won the lottery four weeks in, mm. uh, he, he's in some financial trouble and he lays three of us off. Mm. I go hit the streets again. I knock on doors at this point. I'm getting really good at knocking on doors <laughs> and I'm in a I park, bet. right? So I'm in a park crying on my cell phone, which was like this big and, you know, holding it like a ghetto blaster and crying. And my family's like, Eva, why are you doing this to yourself? And I'm like, I got to do this. I got to do this. Yeah. Nothing's getting in my way. Yeah. I get my second job and at like a, a PR and marketing firm. Six weeks in, I'm laid off. 20 of us were laid off. There was a, there was a merger. And they were really nice about it. And um, they were really, they were generous in those times to sort of carry me for a couple of months. I literally, I'm, I'm like, what am I gonna do? And there's something about London that, you know, you, you gotta look the part. Well, when you are barely, when you are literally hand to mouth, you, anyway, it, it, was, it was a struggle. What did I do? I went back to the first marketing agency and I said, Peter, you gotta, you gotta take me back. <laughs> you, you need to take me back and you need to give me a raise. <laughs> you need to do this. What did he do? He took me back. I gave you a raise? 
and he gave me a raise. So (laughs) how did those sort of that formative, all of that happened in one year. And what, how does that fuel purpose? Well, gosh, my word for 2021 is brave. It's a culmination of who I be, trials and triumphs, um, you know, that, that sort of grazes the surface of some of the, the, the trials. I'm a real person. I have a real life. I have a family history. That right there is symbolic of my grit and the resilience and my perseverance. Even in a pandemic, my business is going to thrive and I will yep. help people. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm loving it. Super tenacious. I hadn't heard that before. I think that is so Eva. It's so interesting to me. I think, I think brave is, uh, is a beautiful word for you, but I think that that story, your story that you've shared here shows us like the tenacity required, right? Just to but you have to, it's bigger than just tenacity, Eva. Like I see it as who you are, mm-hmm. right? This is, this is a woman at 20 or whatever in your early 20s that shows all of the different capabilities that you show today. My business will be successful Absolutely. in a pandemic. And it also, not to get too hippie on anybody here, but it's about energy, mm-hmm. right? If you have... Thoughts have energy. I really believe that. Mm -hmm. And if you have that tenacious, you are going to take me back. You are going to give me a raise. My business is going to do well. That's energy. Mm -hmm. Or the opposite of that would be, oh, I'm defeated. I'm a victim. Oh, well, we are in a pandemic, don't you know? There's a very different thought process that you, you brought to that that I think really shapes your character and your values. I think that's beautiful. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and I think that there's been, there's been a lot of influences too. Um, uh, there's influences like, you know, my blessed grandmother, paternal grandmother, who was selling real estate into her eighties, who used to say to me literally on repeat year after year, never rely on a man, bless the good men on this earth. But she'd say, never rely on a man. Go out, get a good job, create a future, right? Um, and you there- know, you've, you've mentioned your grandma before. What was the deal around Aloha? Oh, Aloha. Well, she, she lived in Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, oh, okay. In, yep. in her last several years. And that was, she said, her tips were never rely on a man, always keep dancing, always... <laughs> there's more. You can just imagine a real character, right? So there's been lots of influences that created that drive. I was also, um, you know, I was also raised by a single mother. And so I wanted to be independent. I wanted independence yeah. to know that no matter what, tomorrow was going to be okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And I'm hardwired to do that. So I want to turn the, yeah. let's turn, let's turn the tables over to your disco balls and I'd love to, the same question over to you. I mean, a piece of your story that shapes you. Yeah, it's interesting. I actually just thought of another uh, story that I wouldn't mind sharing. You know, Mm -hmm. second year university (laughs) and I was enrolled in um, a class called political geography. Mm -hmm. Sounds fascinating, doesn't it? Sounds like an amazing (laughs) fit for you. Yeah. Um, and so first class I show up and there's, I don't know, let's call it a hundred people in a sit down and the professor uh, shows up and says, you know, there's not going to be an exam in this class. Everybody's like, yeah, right on. Second breath was hundred percent of your mark is going to be based on a presentation that you're going to have to give. So we're going to give you a country and you're going to have an hour to basically talk about the politics of that country. I got Zimbabwe, by the way. Um, so second, second class um, comes, and how many, how many students do you think are in, in the class from 100? I probably got the numbers wrong, but approximately. I mean, I, did, did, uh, I don't know. Did a number of them drop out? 
uh, most of them. <laughs> so the class went from 100 to let's say 30, something crazy. And I was also doing the math on this, like how is everybody gonna have an hour? Like, how are they gonna do this logistically? There's only so many days that were, so the fear of speaking was petrifying to, to people in such a way that they said, oh, well, screw that. I'm, I'm going to drop out of the class. I don't know why I, I chose to stay because I was equally petrified at the age of 19. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did my work. I, I prepared as I did. Um, five minutes before I'm supposed to actually do the presentation, where do you think I was? <laughs> in the bathroom? Oh, yeah. I was in the bathroom. So there's all kinds of physiological things that happen to you when you get super nervous, right? Like I was puking, sweating, flushing, like everything that, that can happen was happening. Um, finally get up on, on do my presentation and, you know, I've got the uh, voice and, you know, all of that is going on. And, and I got through it and I think I ended up getting a B plus, which was probably the best B plus I ever got. But why I'm, I'm thinking about this right now is that so often people say to me, oh, I could never do what you do. Like I could never get up in front of groups of people and talk. Well, the story is that's where I started at 19. So it, it is just a measure of practice, practice, practice. And then, um, you know, I, I was involved in Dale Carnegie, you know, you're familiar with how to win friends and influence people, mm, the book, at, Dale Carnegie at a high level. Yeah. So I not only took the, the program, but then I became what it is called the graduated assistant. And then, um, and it's, I think I certified as an instructor. Um, and every single time I had to do a talk, the same thing would happen. Mm -hmm. I would like sweat, I would have every physiological reaction. So, so when someone sees the end product that's hopefully being somewhat professional, some, somewhat articulate, it's rooted in that story, mm -hmm. right? The story of someone being completely fear bound. So that's one story. Another story, um, is around, you know, when we think the question really is that we're, we're trying to answer here is what is the story that changed you as a person the most? Mm -hmm. And I would say for any parent out there that having a kid is a pretty profound and significant <laughs> occurrence and it would change you. My story is, yes, I have one child, 14, his name is Atticus, um, but he is a special needs kiddo. And so when I think about the person that I am today, it's rooted in the experiences that we've shared for the last 14 years. So empathy, curiosity, being in the now. So Atticus has a lot of complexities around his special needs. Um, and so he has good days and bad days. And so on the bad days, you gotta be in the moment with him. And on the good days equally, um, you're in it with him. So regardless of my day, if he is in a good mood, we're in a good, I'm in a good mood. The whole family is in a good mood. So when I think about um, how does that personal story really translate into the professional story, I, our, our leadership philosophy at Talk Talk is simple. Be kind. Mm -hmm. And be kind because everybody has a story. Mm -hmm. So I... I think that, frankly, before Atticus was born, I likely didn't have, was probably a bit selfish. You know, it was probably a bit self-centered. Probably was a bit, you know, all of those things If as I really look back. Um, so he has not only changed me, but everybody around us. I, I, you know, I've said this before, I'll say it again, everybody needs to have an Atticus in their life. Um, he's pure joy and, and, and bliss. Um, and it's part of the reason why I thought it was really important to start Talk Talk. Talk Talk is a leadership um, organization, but the sister organization is called the One Stop Special Needs Shop. And so for when any, anybody, any client works with us, they need to understand that that, that that money that goes into Talk Talk also fuels this other organization, which is really based on helping families and children with um, special needs. And that's 
because of my own experience. So your experiences, I think, or I'll talk about my own, my experience is that I need to live a purpose-driven life. Mm -hmm. I can't just want to amass a bigger house, a nicer car, mm -hmm. nicer clothes, bigger disco ball. It's, it is, it's got to be more than that. And I use the phrase existential angst a lot. Like, why are we all here? Like, what is the meaning of life? And I, I really do believe the meaning in my life is to help help in general, whether it be leaders in organizations, but also families that are, are in a similar circumstance um, as mine. Mm. Whoa, mm. Well, <laughs> that I, was a I, lot. I love it. I, 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 you know, you know, I, I hear themes of, you know, I think something that you and I share, which is, is, is perseverance. Um, yeah, and also a deep a deep love and commitment for this gorgeous dude in your life. Yeah. I, you framed it as, you know, we hear lots of, of, of folks say, well, you know, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a mother, I'm an auntie by blood or, or not. And I, I do relate to the idea that, you know, children teach us things. Mm -hmm. He, it sounds like you are literally a better version of you because mm the gift that is him yeah yeah 100 percent. and something that you and i've talked about that connects in with stories and understanding one another's stories is mm -hmm. in how people respond to learning about atticus and some of the hard mm -hmm. moments and some of the responses mm -hmm. that you get which I hear as being rooted in assumption of the story. Yeah. Can, you, can you share yeah. even one or two examples that, that illustrate that? Yeah, and I think, you know, a lot of the times people have various reactions and it's really rooted in kindness. So I take it as such, I really do. Mm -hmm. It's not, they're not trying to be hurtful, but I think one of the things that I think the broader population needs to understand, at least from my perspective, my lens of having a kiddo like Atticus, is when you say things like, oh, I could never do that. I don't know how you do it. And the truth is, is that you would do it. If you, if you were afforded the luxury of having an Atticus, then you would, you would do it. You would figure it out just like I am. Hmm. Um, so I, I think it's, it's it's important to put out to the the community that if you do know a parent that has a kiddo like Atticus, you might want to pause before saying such you know stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know it's it's a teachable moment, which which when I'm been told that, I often say, well, you would do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, to to your earlier point, am I a better human being uh, because I've been gifted with this child? One hundred percent um yeah so that's one of my stories and yeah. then i threw in a political geography one you, you got any others in there <laughs> well, isn't, it, isn't it funny the things that we can't the, the things we persevere with that maybe aren't in alignment with where we need to go and yet we're so determined because we think we we should that's a whole other episode on shooting um and what oh yeah what courage to get up in front of everybody and you know years later you love sharing with others you love speaking yes. dialogue yes with others yes yeah so, yeah it's so it's so funny because i mean back to that one though you know if anybody would have told me that day you know as i was hovering over the toilet <laughs> throwing up that one day I would have a company called talk talk and I would talk for a living mm -hmm. I would have I would have laughed so heartily so it's amazing how our stories you know um really dictate who we become I could have very easily easily had dropped that class too yeah yeah wouldn't yeah, have I started that journey at all Yes, uh, I could have flown home. Um, you right? could have flown home. And yet it's it's interesting how all these experiences shape us. So 
one of my top values is courage. My word for the year is brave. They're interrelated, just the same thing. And isn't it interesting how through fervor, I coach people on their courage. Yes. Uh, that's ultimately what it has come down to as they're navigating things like firsts, lots of firsts, yes. especially in the pandemic. Yes. So it all comes full circle in who we be if we so choose to explore it within ourselves and yep. explore with others. And so, you know, what are some tips we want to leave folks with? What's one? Yeah, I think for me, Eva, I think the biggest one is get curious. Hmm. Um, and again, honoring the fact that some people want to share their stories, some people don't. I might want to share more than others. Hmm. But get genuinely curious before you enter into conversations to say, what's going on underneath their waterline? And if I understand what that is, again, it doesn't have to be a story about special needs. It could be, you know, something, it could be anything, but lowering that waterline of that iceberg will, in my humble estimation, will improve your relationships, whether you're a CEO, whether you're, you know, an individual contributor in an organization, whether just because you're human being showing genuine interest in, in everybody's story will, and this is going to sound dramatic, but I do believe it, will, will change your life. That's why we've chosen this as, as the number one episode. You really get curious about everybody's story, your life will change. Not only everybody else's story, but your own story. And doing what we just did, which was an exercise in looking back or in present mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. future. Yeah. What's a tip that you want to share? I think, you know, uh, honoring, honoring our own stories is a piece of the work in this space. And uh, I think there's, you know, there's a, there's, there's a couple of ways to go about that. One thing that comes to mind, uh, a phrase that a client once used, you got to have a team of support. And I, I love that. I think that team of support can include, and I speak from personal experience, having invested in these resources, and I've had the gift of being able to invest in these resources as well. So I do, I do honor that. And there are, so I'll, I'll name them. And then there are also, uh, you know, state, provincially, otherwise funded resources as well when we go looking for them. Team of support can include an amazing counselor, lots of counselors mm. operating in niche fields, um, more coming out of the woodwork in these times with the demand, can include uh, amazing friends. Some of us have amazing yep. family, some, some have challenged relationships. Whatever the connections are, community. So have precious community, invest in community and connection. It doesn't have to be with a hundred people. It can be one, two, um, a coach. You know, I believe to be a coach is also to be coached. So I will yes. always, I think 100% agree. Right? Yeah. It's a, it's, it, it's a learning part of it is being in a learning model, a ton of niche areas that coaches are getting into. That's absolutely, it's fascinating. There are ADHD coaches there. Are, I mean, the, the list goes on, mm -hmm. on how many people are getting into mm -hmm. fascinating areas in service of healthier communities and people. So having a team of support, asking for help, um, dig in to do the work. Some of us, you know, some of the, the world is carrying so much grief right now and so much weight and heaviness and some fear. Uh, and I think that trauma, right? And so that team of support can make or break some people. Another way to honor stories is uh, something that's really fun to do, which is similar to the lifeline exercise. And it's, uh, 
it's a it's a method that I learned through my deep work in positive intelligence with Shuzad Shamin, who's a neuroscience researcher. He taught mm -hmm. us to facilitate these sessions where you divide your life by, I can't remember if it's eight or 10 years, and you explore your experiences, your learnings, your observations uh, through to the gifts of each of those chapters. And then you name the essence mm -hmm. of each chapter. Then you elevate it Ooh. further from there and you, you come up with a purpose statement your story of why oh i love that it's it, it, it's fun and i did a little experiment with a pod not long ago and the group was like "Woo, that was deep and it was safe yeah it felt safe so some really fun fun places that people can go to there any other any other tips or have we loaded people up pretty well I think we've low. I think you know here here here's how I distill down like an hour's long worth of conversation mm. is it matters. Yeah. It matters. Mm -hmm. If it is to understand your own story and other stories. Um and being cognizant and conscious that before every conversation that that it should be a goal is to connect mm -hmm. to, to someone else's humanness. And that's in essence what we're, we're suggesting here. Um, it does our next episode, oh, go ahead. Oh, yes. and, and oh. there's there's the leg. Um, yes. And <laughs> honoring, <laughs> awkward. Um, I think also honoring, it's, it's not saying, so uh, what's your story? You seem pretty upset today. I, I, I think, yeah. Instead of holding judgment, know with yes. it that another has yes. a story that we do not know. And yes. being open to that can show up in lots of different ways. Simply just yes. being mindful, having a mantra of this person has a story that I do not know. And right now they need me to listen and show empathy. Just that well, way. where I started the where where we started this thing is remember that every everyone you meet is afraid of something, loves something, and has lost something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Who who well, said that quote? That was beautiful. Jackson Brown Jr. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, and Oprah even says everybody has a story and there's something to be learned from every experience. Absolutely. So I think, I think that's what we've really explored over the last, we could likely go on for another hour is my guess. But um, so on our next episode, please tune in. We won't, we won't tell you what it is yet because we're still musing on that. Um, we want to say thank you to the folks that came and visited and watched our very first episode. We want to say, stay pithy, uh, oh. keep musing. Yeah. Um, but if you're interested to find us, let's say you're just interested to find us, you can find Eva at livewithfervor.com. Oh, why do I always say live? You can say live. See, now they're good. Now they're going to remember it. Live, say it. Livewithfervor.com. If you want to find me, you can find me at talktalk.ca. No spaces, obviously. You know what I love? Um, I love what? that I said, I want you to say, stay pithy, keep music, yeah. and you did it. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to you, Eva. <laughs> to you the, final, the final place that you can find us is um, our channel on YouTube, Pithy yeah. Musings. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about the playlist? Yeah. We, so we and created the, our first ever playlist. It it's on Spotify. Yeah. It's under Pithy Musings. And our first playlist is Pithy Musings 2021. And it's a collection of some of our favorite grooves to get you started and keep you dancing for days to come, regardless of the pandemic. Just like my grandmother said, you got to keep dancing. So. Got to keep dancing. Yeah. So. so 
So yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask you. Yeah, I, I know you're trying to close it out, but I wanted to know what your favorite song on that playlist. Mine is the hustle. Oh, oh, let me think on that. Let me think on that okay. too, because I, I, I love them all, and I don't know if you noticed when it was my turn to add songs, it was like. <laughs> I, <laughs> I did notice. <laughs> and I'm laughing because behind you is the keep it simple. And I just <laughs> had this massive list. Of <laughs> I'll get back to you. Guys. Um, okay, perfect. I don't know. Maybe I'm every woman. It's pretty good. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So. Yeah, love it. Um, we're super excited about next time. And uh, you can contact either one of us on the website URLs that Carolyn's just shared. Uh, if you've got feedback, thoughts, questions, ideas, topics that you want to hear us muse with pithiness, bring it. We'd love to hear from you. And I guess until next time, stay pithy, keep music. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>